Welcome. Oh, recording progress now, you know. Um, welcome to everyone on the call today. So good to see you and so many familiar faces and a really a uh, couple of new ones too. So I'm really great to see that. And welcome to everyone who's going to see this later because they weren't able to join live. I know we've got many different time zones and it's always tough. Um, but we're going to talk about trends. And trends is definitely a, um, a topic that uh, I personally always have a bit of a difficult relationship with because it does make me feel of things that are of fashion and things that are temporary. But I've learned from working with people who do trends in a much more kind of fundamental way that they're also really crucial to help you to look ahead at what's happening in the world. And I thought um, also inspired by a comment from George a couple of sessions ago, like, hey, it would be amazing. We have this kind of global team of eyes and ears around the world if we could all bring something that we think is a trend or some emerging movement from our part of the world, if we can all bring that in and share um, together what we think is important in our work at the intersection of brands and, and social change. So we had invited um, uh, Raquel from Brazil and Mark from uh, Kenya to come and specifically prepare for us because they, they have a, quite a specialization within trends to prepare some, uh, some notes and thoughts for us. They're not here yet. Raquel's having internet problems and um, we don't know where Mark is at the moment. So if they still come on, um, we'll definitely jump to them. But uh, in the meantime, actually, um, we also have George who is going to share something about social licensing. We have um, Abhilash with us, who's uh, uh, in India, he's a collaborator of mine. Hey, Abhilash, good to see you. Abhilash has, has his whole own niche that um, he's gonna share some ideas about. Um, I am representing Sandra today, who couldn't be here because she has a dentist appointment, which is also very important. Um, and we want to talk about some of the, uh, a, a little bit moral dilemma that we feel is coming up more often. And we actually would love to invite you to participate. So if you have something to share, something to contribute, like join the conversation immediately. And also we're gonna um, uh, pull in your ideas. So. As always, we have a Miro board. I'm just gonna share it here in the chat. And on the Miro board, you'll find the um, names and um, the different ideas and some links already. So if you want to revisit some of the ideas that were shared today, um, feel free to, um, to use this link and look at the board. We'll also share them as notes tomorrow. And we'll be adding uh, things to this as we go around the room. Um, so in absence of um, uh, Mark and Raquel, I think uh, I'll, open, <laughs> I'll open the conversation um, by representing Sandra. So I hope I do that properly. Um, but if you, uh, so if you take a look at the, at the mirror board, you'll find Sandra and myself here on the left. Um, and what we wanted to put forward for um, the conversation with you guys today is that um, uh, we really see this uh, mounting evidence of people getting um, purpose tired, the whole uh, washing of green, whether it's green washing, woke washing, et cetera, and that the playbook of purpose, um, brands using that concept that Patagonia so successfully uh, piloted of, you know, don't buy something and uh, now people are going to buy it or the um, the idea of storytelling to get people in that consumers are getting ever more critical and I think rightfully so and we thought that was very you know a conversation that might be relatable to some of you and I think Sandra's particular point like what really triggered her on this topic was um, Tony Chocoloni the Dutch chocolate brand um, they did a, make a big hoopla about um uh, being part of the problem and telling people that they should eat less of their chocolate bars. And Sandra's point was, well, like, okay, they have 50% 50, 50 of their chocolate bar actually is sugar. Um, and shouldn't they be doing something about the product itself versus making a big fuss about, um, about this campaign? And we almost felt like um, the world of well, the world of purpose brands and, and impact brands is being really heavily influenced by this because I'm starting to become a, starting to feel like a theater, like a theater where 
things are on display for us. And we, as the audience, are part of the performance. And so Sandra and I were discussing, is this something that other people recognize? We are sure this is gonna get, you know, potentially get more and more uh, backlash over the next year. And we feel like in a way it undermines uh, or it poorly reflects on the work that we're trying to do. So this is something, not so much a trend, but something that we definitely see as a trend in our own lives. And we were very curious what you guys um, thought about it. So that's the first um, topic um, for today. Is there, is there anyone who recognizes that, um, what Sandra and I sketch? Definitely comes more and more through the LinkedIn feed. Um, uh, on both sides of it, the the praise. I love that this company is being open, and then on the other side of it, also the criticism. Like they're trying to be so open, but we don't know who they really are. Mm. Um, and do you see that? Do you see that in a network of people who are already on, let's say, working on the impact side, or is that? Do you see that also going more mainstream? I don't know for sure because I think my mm. my feed is probably filled with people who um, and the robots are feeding me what I need to see. <laughs> um, but I, I think there's a little bit of both of it because I think the spectrum in, includes the, 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 the impact spectrum includes people all the way from one side to the just barely initiated side. And yeah. I'm sure there's some unwilling um, unwillingness there, but I don't know. Do you feel it, it? it's impacting how you think about the brand that you're building, Zaylin? Absolutely. Yeah. Where um, even just a couple of years ago uh, and even before the um, academy that I ran the change, the, um, the idea of transparency and truth seemed more novel. Um, and now it's uh, losing some of its cred because of the nature of the companies that are using it as a tactic. Um, and it's only few cases I'm, I'm finding and, and this is where I have to be careful. It's not, it's not everybody, so it's still unique enough, um, but I don't know. Yeah, uh, well, so I was, answer, yes. yeah, well, I was thinking if there is a whole brainstorm to be had about this idea of, of transparency and truth within branding, like how, what does that mean? And what does it mean for your communications? And I know that a lot of people who are inside companies are really struggling with wanting to be open about things, not always like it's when you're thinking about the spectrum, like it's often very clear what is absolutely wrong and it's very clear what is absolutely correct or right or truthful, but like everything in between is a gray zone and like understanding what to do and how to act like almost requires like a masterclass in ethics in a way. And I'd always thought maybe this, this whole idea of like, how do you run this ethically? We had a brainstorm about that last year as well, but could be worth a whole new area of investigation of like, what are the best case studies? So if there's anyone who says like, oh, you know, I know this brand actually gets this right, like they're truthful, um, but they're also engaging and effective. I'd love to, to hear examples from people as well. Is there is there anyone else who feels like, yeah, this? Um, this is weighing heavily on my mind. Well, I think to me, what bothers me and what I see a lot is that uh, companies, uh, they sort of put, um, you know, the, the customer, they sort of blame them like, okay, so you are, uh, you can make the right decisions. You have the power in your hands, whereas the companies actually have the power in their hand. Like with Tony Chocolo only, they can just lower their sugar if they find it's such an important topic, but it's a lot of times towards the customer. So you can choose like the green way, you can choose the healthy side, you can choose this sustainable option instead of taking responsibility for yourself. And I think that's happening a lot now. It's like, it's the greenwashing uh, topic. Do you have any particular particular examples of something that like irks you or? Um, well, I think you see it now, like in the Dutch supermarkets a lot that they sort of brand their, their product in like this very green way. Like, I think maybe you posted an example as well, like buy this shampoo and save the planet. Like, mm -hmm. 
I think you see that a lot now in, in visual branding. Mm -hmm. Hyperbole. A lot of people are using very big terms. Yeah, cool. For I don't know if that's a Dutch thing or if it's like happening all over the world, actually. I'm curious, Josa in the in the Philippines is like this, is the whole purpose thing a thing? Yeah, I I mean, definitely for here in the Philippines, because we've been badly hit by the pandemic also, a lot of companies are jumping in uh, on the bandwagon of like pivoting their businesses um, to be something more than what they are. And so you see a lot of companies trying to help everywhere and I guess in a way that's a good thing because they're trying to um, position themselves but I guess that's where you you get this dilemma where where do you draw the line between these companies are helping yes that's true but then um, you know that they're also doing this to make themselves look good in, in an economy that's struggling right now and so I think I don't I'm right now as a consumer myself I don't know where I stand um in terms of like this company is trying to pivot to a purpose more purposeful direction so mm. I, yeah I wish there were you know I remember on on Star Trek there was that little device that they would scan if you were ill and I want to have this device that I can scan if you actually have good intentions like I want to be able to see like are you sincere about this <laughs> cool um, we have, uh, we have, uh, Mark with us now. Hey, Mark, welcome. So great to see you. Um, Mark is the founder of Nendo and Nendo is a digital marketing agency, but they also do some really great, um, forecasting in Kenya and Mark and Wendy and I have collaborated on projects in the past and we thought he would be just the perfect person to come and share with us what's kind of. Um, there's perspective on these different trends that are emerging in, in this new year from um, not just from Kenya and the continent, but because he's so deeply rooted in digital, I think he'll have um, ideas um, that will uh, apply to all of us where we are. Hey, Mark, did I introduce you properly? Yeah, that was uh, that was perfect. I hope you guys can all uh, hear me okay. And um, yeah, sunny uh, regards, sending sunshine to everyone uh, across the across the. The globe we have uh, we have a fair bit of it today and i'm quite happy with uh, the weather so so sending that in my regards so thank you for having me Anne, and looking forward to sharing with everyone cool well i i know a couple of people on this call could really use some rays of sunshine so um you're a welcome addition uh so what we're doing mark is where we we're going around the room so we have we have six people who um wanted to get some airtime today and I know you and Raquel um, prepared um, quite a bit, especially for us. So I wanted to give you about 10 minutes to share what you've prepared for us. And I'm sure there will be people with questions. Are you open to having people interrupt you midway or would you rather just share what you're saying and have people ask questions afterwards? Yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm open for people to um, ask me midway, happy to, to, to take on that. And then uh, I might ask you for a bit of help with, um, with, uh, with keeping me on time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know, because if people, if people I, come in, but yeah, I know my Kenyans. I know my Kenyans. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know we have a Kenyan and a Brazilian on the call today, so I know my timekeeping uh, skills will be in order. Cool. Uh, yeah, no, go ahead. Um, if you want to uh, share your screen, Mark, you should be able to share the screen for Miro. We can also yes. open it for you. Yeah. Um, I'm. I'm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I was figuring my way around uh, Miro just now. So I will I will accept the screen share. Awesome. Um, here we go. Might need a verbal confirmation that you can see my screen. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I've got a, a couple of things to share. I'll probably start, I think, on this side and work my way in. So um so one of the, the, the first ones is a really interesting question that I got to asking myself um, some, some time back. There's a strange thing that you see happening here with Kenya's economy every time it's an election year. Uh, the economy either recedes or, you know, it's into the um, and in this case scenario, we're just we're just growing, but effect. Except in this case, with the bank sector, 
economy is bouncing back. So you, you run this uh, over a couple um, uh, decades and you see a similar trend. So it's something I was asking. We seem to have lost Mark. Sorry, guys. Yeah, yes, you're back. Yes, I'm, I'm, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm tethering and I, and I, and I just, I, I just, I was like, I just needed to behave, uh, which I think it's good to do now. Um, but, but yeah, so the, this question of why would it be that, that an election year, just with the uncertainty and the questions that it brings of people uh, would cause the economy to shrink. And, and is that, uh, is there a silver lining to that? Um, and so I've seen this in places like Uganda as well, Zimbabwe, et cetera. And, and even though some of these countries are going through what's a, a really great um, a democratic process with a change of power and a change of parties in some cases, uh, this effect on the economy and on spending and just people's confidence that they can make every day, every year uh, decisions, uh, they generally tend to have a bit more of caution and so do investors during that time. So the question for me became, um, what opportunities could this open up? And so I was in a, a workshop with um, a gentleman called Richard Short, Richard uh, shared with me um, uh, this idea that one of the interesting things for brands or businesses and certainly folks like us who are change makers in a sense and using brands for good is when we are trying to explore behavior change, what are the triggers that open up the opportunity for somebody to either attempt something new um, or think of something different? In many we stick to what we know uh, go with what's familiar from memory, and 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 he exposed me to this uh, this study. And so what this study uh, did, and I, I I beg your pardon, I hope the wind is not too much, but but what it unlocked was this idea that life events um, are a massive opportunity to get people to either try new brands or experiences. So what's a life event? Well, it could be um, things such as uh, getting a new job, um, moving house, um, a marriage or a divorce, uh, the addition of a new kid. Um, in, in, into your life. Um, and so there's basically these, these life events that, that, that just for a brief moment open us to new, um, either new neural pathways or just new openness to, to things that we call familiar and, and ordinary. Um, and so if you're looking at makeup brands, or cinema, or coffee shops, lagers, broadband cars, or sort of big corporations here, including the train. Uh, for me, I started asking myself, and, and we've got a couple of hypotheses this year on, can we use the elections in a sense as a chance to introduce people to new ways of thinking, either about democracy itself or gathering or the way we get and exchange information. Um, and so I'll, I'll mention another um, a project that we're up to, uh, but this particular one, um, it has been something that stuck uh, on me and just how life events can open this up. And I would venture a guess that part of the reason our economy shrinks and everyone sort of collectively holds their breath and their purse strings is that they're wondering what's going to happen and all mm -hmm. about to go through a life event. And so my hope is that, uh, yeah, this, this parks a couple interesting ideas on what you can use life events for. And I certainly will be trying to use August 8th in Kenya when Kenya all comes to uh, a collective deep breath as a time for us to, to try new things or think in new ways. I think this will be interesting for a client of mine, um, because uh, they're quite young and so this might be a really interesting time for them to actually find a new market where it's very competitive. The book that you're referring to, if I'm correct, Mark, is rich, from Richard Schott in The Choice Factory, right? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. I have it. I have it as well here on my, on my Kindle on my phone. It's a good book. So for anyone who's interested in, in learning more about the science of behavior change and psychology on marketing and branding, that's a really nice book tip. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, thank you. If there's any questions, please uh, please let me know. But I'll move on to the second um, of the three that I I come prepared to share. Um, so I think one of the the things that that we found with social media, with smartphones, um, has historically been this this question of time and attention. Um, and so one of the things I'm thinking quite a lot about this year is the what I call the last stand in emerging markets. So I think if you're in the uh, you know, Europe, Australia, the US, UK, or, um, you know, some of the more um, larger global economies in the world where smartphone penetration is effectively about as high as it's going to really be. 
Um, I mean, you can walk into a lot of like, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, phone companies and, and you get a contract and they'll basically have you walk out with the phone. Um, in, in somewhere like Kenya, which I should say is, is known as Silicon Savannah, um, there's still another barrier. So it, it, the way Netflix in the U um, and any of these other uh, competitors that, that other film and video demand people are, we actually are trying to have you sleep a little less. And if we do that, we've been successful. So Netflix is an example for me of what I would call the companies that are now saying, we want as much of your time. And then as when we have all of that, we want as much of your active attention. And obviously, so are uh, you know, Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and others. But there's a question on, uh, at least for this part of the world, the, the missing link. So the missing link for me, to give you an illustration, Netflix has a free plan in Kenya. Because for them, they, hit, they very quickly hit a ceiling where it didn't matter the fact that they were Netflix. People are not going to take their time and attention there. And having a price didn't help. Now, for me, I think they broke new ground by saying, look, we'll give this for you, to you with no ads. Just please, just take it and use it and experiment with it. We both want your data and we want to see what you like and what you use. But what they're also saying here is there's only one last barrier to cross. And I would call that the mobile data barrier. So here, because people are on prepaid phone plans, they economize their data. So I, have a, I might have a lot of time, I might have a lot of attention, but I only have 100 megabytes. And so I might not go for Netflix on that particular day. I might not, you know, I might stick to WhatsApp and a few other places or and this, I think, is the net neutrality conversation in, in full swing. Um, I'll really stick to the places where I can get more access, you know, to Facebook for free for 24 hours. If it means I have 100 megabytes for school and everything else. Um, and so for me, in this world of Zoom, we're on a Zoom call right now. I'm not sure how many of you know how many hundreds of megabytes a video Zoom call takes. But to me, one of the most interesting um, African companies I came across is uh, this company in South Africa called... Um, um, they, well, they, what are they called? They're called, um, uh, I'm thinking of their product. They have a, a, a message, messaging app that's free for data. And they have this platform called Vido. So what Vido does is Vido says, as a school, you know, a young student, uh, just trying to make ends meet, you already don't have enough for school fees and all of that at university. If they're asking you to go on Zoom, they should pay for it. The school should pay for it. In the same way that Netflix has said, we want you to watch movies, we'll pay for it. All you have to do is actually pay with your data. They are going the extra mile to say that video conferences and webinars shouldn't actually have people pay with their mobile data. Now, this is in a world where I know many of us are probably dialing in from home on a fixed line connection um, or in a cafe, you've got Wi-Fi. But if people have to stream with their data bundles, I'm actually tethering right now. So I'm on my data bundles right now. Um, there's this idea of who picks up the tab for that. So unfortunately, there's companies like, I think, sports betting companies and others who've taken on this burden saying, OK, we want to lower the floor let more people come in obviously facebook and others have said you can access our platform for free but not google or not other resources but to me this is interesting and and it's something for uh the next five years to potentially even the next decade which is how and who picks up the tab for people's participation when you reach basically saturation of the, the people who can't afford a smartphone and have data to spare so how do you remove that last barrier now probably my last point on this um which is just hopefully to to shed some light on, on the challenges of getting a smartphone to begin with, much less maintaining it. This here is from the Alliance for Affordable Internet. And they're talking about in many of these countries, how many days would you have to work just to afford a smartphone? Um, and if you look at Sierra Leone, it's almost you know, half, a, well, half a year um, or close to it. A lot of other countries, you see India here, it's actually um, north of 50 days. And then you basically have a whole range of, um, of countries across uh, Latin America, um, Africa, um, and, and, and Asia, broadly speaking. Um, and so to me, this here just shows the work that's still there yet to be done and the opportunity that's there when we say, OK, smartphones for everyone, it's, it's not always that simple because even just buying the smartphone, much less maintaining it, uh, many people will pay separately for it to be charged. That's there. And then last but not least, another barrier, sadly, is uh, the gender aspect, meaning that there are countries like Kenya, which are known a lot for tech, but you still have women getting arbitrary, um, if you look at number four here on, on mobile ownership, that sometimes family either doesn't approve, or a study came out last year um, uh, from a, a management consultancy called Dalberg, uh, where they showed that, that even girls in school get arbitrary limits imposed on the time that they have with devices, even when they're doing schoolwork. Um, so we still have some ways to go in terms of 
challenges and barriers that women will face, much less the ones that people with mobile phones would face, smartphones, and then when those smartphones are there, actually having the data. So to me, something I'm watching for is who takes the mantle? And it could be a company as big as Netflix with money to burn to say, we'll pay for the data. Uh, you just come in and use our platform. And of course, there could be problematic aspects of that too. Yeah. Okay, I can see I'm my children time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wonder if, um, if, we can, if we can touch upon the misinformation um, later in the session, if we, sure. if we have sure, a bit sure. of extra. Because yeah, I also yeah, I wanted to give my... people the chance to be able to maybe ask you a question. If there's anyone who has a question for Mark, it's like, hey, I wonder about this or that, or I wonder how this might apply in, in my region of the world. Um, uh, we just, uh, we shared the link to the book by Richard on the mirror as well as in the chat. And I also wanted to give it one other side note, uh, Mark, you mentioned Dahlberg. For those of you who don't know Dahlberg, they're kind of like the McKenzie of um, the development sector. So if you're interested in reading up more about reports um, on um, the Global South, Dahlberg is always a source of, um, of information. Do you see, Mark, um, any, like this idea of smartphone data, so the brands picking up on this cost, do you see also small companies being able to do that? Or is that really something you can only do when you're at scale? Oh, we might have lost Mark. Oops. Well, it's good evidence of the whole data is very <laughs> data is important. Um, was there anyone who had questions for Mark? Because I'm also happy to connect you guys after the call. I see in the meantime, we've had um, Raquel join. Did she come in? Yes. Yeah. I see Raquel coming in. Hey, Mark, we lost you there for a second. Yeah, sorry about that. That was uh, a mobile data playing trick, tricks on me, <laughs> <laughs> ironically. Yeah. Is there anyone with a question for Mark? Otherwise, we'll um, move to Raquel. Okay. Did you hear my question at the end, Mark, about like how would this work for smaller companies or do you have to be a mammoth to be able to start um, paying for the data of your users? Um, I think it could work for small companies. Some of the ways I've, I've, uh, I've mentioned this to, to, to people before is if you have a mobile app and you are activating sort of physically, um, coming with a little MiFi and, and just allowing people the, the benefit of, you know, not having to pick up the app on, on sort of their tab um, to register and to start. I've seen that before as a sort of guerrilla marketing tactic and a way to make it almost a concierge experience for the first couple of early adopters that I think plays into this. Uh, even though it might not scale at, at large, but just finding places where that's, that barrier is removed for people, I find that can give you great feedback and hopefully get more people to actually follow through on what you're asking them to do, which is to, to explore your digital uh, product or service. So is it, um, is it also, I guess it's a very good way of, of obviously marketing and growing, growing the user base. So you're basically paying, uh, instead of putting the money into advertising, you're, you're creating something very uh, alluring because it's because it's free. Do you think these types of um, offers though also rely very heavily on like, yeah, we want your data. Um, whereas in particular low income economies, there might be less uh, st stringent uh, privacy rules where that is possible. Or do you think this could also work in um, places like Europe where, where, where privacy is really, really well guarded? Yeah, I think we, you know, I have aspirations to see, you know, what what we've done with GDPR um, and privacy broadly in terms of regulation um, of these large tech tech companies with fines and with actual, you know, having them toe the line that that would be applied universally. I think the challenge we're seeing now is that, you know, if you are European or based physically in Europe or using a VPN that connects you to there, the rules suddenly apply to you. But if you're not, they sort of, you know, you know, are happy to sort of excuse. Uh, many of those um, those those rules and and then circumvent them. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, I think I think <laughs> uh, there you go. Like a bit of data listening into <laughs> to my to my chat here. So yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd say that that for us here, the the privacy thing or the privacy conversation for me, sadly, um, like we wrote a trend report in 2019 about how people use their mobile data, similar to what we said here. I think it's becoming a, a basically a, a wealth and class issue where people who have means will actually be able to afford privacy. 
um, and people who don't have to trade it even in some cases for loans and for um, and in some cases they're quite happy to do this don't get me wrong I, they, 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 their perception is quite different you could talk to them and they'll be like no this is just what I do because it's their way of seeing the world so they don't know that it could even be any different thank you so much Mark um, for sharing the points of view um, this is a yeah I think we don't hear enough about um, uh, Kenyans you know Kenya's technology expertise and um, I certainly always have to um, tell people that this is such an amazing hub for technology so happy that you're um, the flag bearer for that today. Cool. Um, hopefully we'll be able to hear from you more during the hour. Hey, Raquel, hope you're okay. Um, are you still there? Okay. Seems Raquel is having <laughs> definite final internet issues. Um, talking about data, um, uh, Abilash, would you, uh, Abilash and I have worked together on several different projects. And um, he is a growth marketing expert and he astonishes me with the amount he knows about his expertise, but also about like new developments in technology. And um, you're based in Bangalore, which is I think world renowned for its technology scene. Um, and soon we'll see, and we'll see Kenya up there too. Hey, Avalesh, welcome. Thanks, Anna. Uh, hey. thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, it's uh, really nice. Uh, I've not been active on the community much, but uh, there's really a good chance to basically come in at this point, like talk, talking about trends. Uh, no, we were just now you're we talking about data privacy. That is something that I uh, have been uh, uh, looking at and my interest in that space other than digital marketing has been consistent, like uh, interest in data analytics and consumer insights. So uh, data privacy, particularly uh, consumer data privacy, uh, is one of the interesting ch changes in consumer behavior, particularly in the last three or four years, like uh, not just uh, in terms of regulations coming in, but uh, the behavior itself, like uh, uh, the awareness of people in terms of what kind of uh, data the businesses or brands are uh, uh, collecting about them and sharing and storing uh, how it is being uh, personally identifiable data for marketing purposes especially over the last two years, uh, even in the pandemic, uh, there's a noticeable change in how users are connecting digitally. There is like, uh, we also discussed, uh, there is a screen time that's been going up, um, um, multiple screens on an average, uh, if you look at global uh, internet connectivity, on an average, people have about three connected devices. Uh, um, and that's with hybrid on working. Average. Yeah. Wow. So there's people That's, who have six and then there's people who have zero. Gaming, all that stuff, but yeah. at least a streaming device, your mobile, mobile is the primary uh, connecting uh, device. Your desktops are there and uh, definitely uh, streaming TV, connected TV. This is basically from a global perspective. This is the trend that is going out. Other than that, uh, you have uh, basically the hybrid working environment. Now you're with the screen time going up, there is also uh, a change in the way we target audiences. Now, they are not uh, limited to a demographic or a targeting by uh, your age and all that. They are into a multi-moment audience uh, who are um, sort of influenced by motivator, monotony, mood, and other motivators like, like uh, we mentioned the life stages of the thing. So it's very important for brands to understand how to target them. Uh, with so much time uh, spent on smart devices and the proportion of time that is spent on uh, other activities online, there is also uh, at least uh, uh, a need for uh, physical and mental well being to be looked at. Uh, and with that comes also the knowledge of what my data uh, is doing, how, how brands or uh, companies are using my data and what safety and privacy uh, protocols are they uh, putting in place. Like people are aware now about uh, the things that they're using tools like VPNs, ad blockers, uh, clearing, regularly clearing their uh, browsing history and uh, cookies uh, to an extent declining some of the uh, 
private uh, information in cookie collection uh, browsing uh, private browsing like you have uh, people moving on from uh, chrome to maybe a brave browser or uh, uh, browsers which don't track you in addition to that you have your mobile devices which collect a lot of uh, uh, personally identifiable user information to an extent uh, that it can locate where you stay on a regular basis where you travel and these these are informations that sometimes uh, people don't uh, expressly provide it is just picked up because if you want to use the application because of the utility you have to share that particular information and uh, users are now understanding that these are things that can be uh, misused like uh, there are uh, data breaches happening election frauds happening like which influences tries to influence your political or your uh, lineages to other things so these Can are I things ask a question which... about that avalash so yes, from from your in your work where you need to reach people to get them engaged with digital products you um, have gotten used to a world um, not to say that people in digital marketing were abusing the open system but you got used to a world where you could target people very specifically on what they had been searching for on what their uh, stated interests were and I can imagine that several trends coming together on data and privacy, but also on chain, like I'm not at all knowledgeable on digital marketing, but I know there is a change coming in terms of um, cookie and, and uh, so, digital So that's, that's exactly, yeah, that's uh, exactly what I'm saying. There yeah. has been two decades of digital marketing has depended on this kind of data that has been yeah. collected. Now you have uh, cookie-based uh, targeting, then user-identified-based targeting, but these things are getting phased out. And uh, it's being pushed for a longer duration because you don't have a ready solution in place. So there is some federated le learning, uh, which is there, which is basically collectively understanding your audience as a group without uh, basically picking up uh, personal identifiers. But then again, uh, Fundamentally, what happens is all this data is aggregated with a centralized authority, it would be a media uh, player like a Facebook or a big tech company. They still have control over these things. Now, what the change that is going to happen in probably in the next two or three years is people opting out of, there is an option of opting out of it. When you have regulations in place and you have more awareness about this, you start opting out of these things. Maybe you start using application and only giving permissions for those things when you get a benefit out of it. So this is where uh, brands also have to understand that you need to be upfront about what data are you collecting from users? Yeah. Is it really important? And how they are going to benefit? It, it's being really clear about how the user is going to benefit from sharing that particular data. Uh, where do you see where do you see opportunities, Alyssa? If you're thinking about okay, this is going to be limiting some of us. I don't know. Maybe we can see a show of hands. Is there anyone who works in digital marketing or ads, and whose work will be impacted by developments like this, or who uses for their brand digital trackers, cookies? It um, would be big time impacted. Uh, it'll impact people who are into e-commerce because mm -hmm. there is a remarketing angle to it. Yeah. App, app uh, retention and re-engagement, wherein you need users to come back to use the app. Or if you drop from a cart, you want users to come back with the same session. Yeah. So you deep yeah. link it. So these are things which require you to identify users as individuals or as devices. So that Apple has at this point basically stopped that IDFA and mm -hmm. uh, Google is going to phase it out in another one year. So this whole uh, industry, ad industry, which is dependent on it, will get affected. This possibly for bigger players who spend a lot, maybe. But even for smaller uh, teams or entrepreneurs also, it's very important for now to focus on things that you can have in hand. So you, you definitely need data about your audience. So you need to uh, basically focus on what is the primary data that I need? Uh, how will I secure it? Uh, and how would I be uh, informing my audience that yes, this is the data I have about you and they should have control over uh, updating or deleting that, opting out of it. So it becomes really important for brands to focus on first party data, their own data they have over the audience. Is there anyone we could follow or 
anything that we need to read where we can start to get ahead of this and think about like, okay, well, but what are, so this is what's going to limit us, but what are potentially new ideas or um, where we can get some inspiration of, or at least a start in how we might get in front of this. Is there anyone you follow that you're like, oh, everyone right. should follow this person um, because they'll help us to um, find yeah. new inroads for our profession. There, there are uh, certain uh, B2B solutions which are being made, like uh, for paid marketing, you have uh, something called Unified ID 2.0, which is an uh, uh, opt-in uh, database kind of a thing, which is managed by multiple advertisers or uh, aggregators who uh, basically uh, validate each and every point of uh, contact with the consumer in a network. So. From an advertising point of view, you use this particular product and you are uh, basically safe in using that data in your communication perspective. But from a consumer point of view, if you see, uh, it has to be uh, something where the control goes back to the consumer. Like uh, the consumer has control over his data and he's able to uh, control what data is being used by uh, the advertiser and also monetize it. So that, that is something, these are certain products that are being developed on blockchain. Uh, and... cool. um, this is really, think, uh, thanks, for the, this is, thanks for the warning. Zaylin, go ahead. Yeah, Vlash, do you think this is something that will benefit, um, I mean, benefit the consumer from a privacy standpoint, but um, uh, do you have comments on whether the big players are gonna find a way around it and win? or the little players who are being honest and truthful are going to uh, get a boost because all of a sudden um, they have more access to truth. The consumer has more access to truth. That's a, that's a great question, Zalin. The point uh, there is now, uh, when you are looking at uh, audiences, not in terms of uh, a huge reach and multiple frequencies of ads running to them, but uh, trying to understand what really is beneficial for them, then uh, it makes it important for you. Maybe you might have a very small audience set, but if you're able to engage with them in a, a much personal way and with a much more creative uh, formats of ads or format of communication per se, uh, particularly your newsletters and all that stuff, I think that, that would be the area where uh, smaller brands or smaller teams would have to focus on and build organic reach and conversions that way. Uh, but as we go ahead, uh, the big tech companies will start losing control over all these things. This will impact the whole industry, of course. But uh, what, what uh, particularly will happen is it's going to get into a reset mode, wherein the consumer will have more control over things. So yeah, that, that's ideally a better situation. Uh, well, it also mean a retooling and reskilling entirely for people exactly. in the marketing space. Exactly. Yes. So I'm sure someone right now is building some courses <laughs> um, <laughs> on how to adapt to this. Um, if you if you have more resources, uh, Abhilash, that you think like this is an article that someone needs to read or this is a person to follow, feel free to paste them on the mirror board. I'm sure there's a couple of oh, people sure, here sure. that would love to dive into I'll, this I'll, topic. Um, I love that. And I was grateful for you to bring these points to my attention last year because I would have been totally ignorant for another <laughs> for another seven months until basically it would have been on the front page of CNN or something. Um, so thanks for sharing. Um, we have George with us and George um, had his eye on um, the concept of social licensing, which I'd love to invite you, George, to talk to us. Explain a little bit more uh, maybe for those of us who don't know what social licensing is and in what, which cases you see it emerging in, in the field of, of brands for change. Right. Hi, everyone. Sorry I was uh, absent for a little while, but I'm trying to get back to speed <laughs> as best I can. Uh, yeah, I, I had a I listen at the podcast, Save the Planet podcast, and the topic was about uh, greenwashing, social licensing, and, uh, and how how advertising is positioning, positioning itself towards social licensing, which I found very interesting. Um, and I find that uh, there's a lot to be done with regards to social licensing. In a nutshell, it's how 
big corporations license themselves to have a light to have a social driven message when in the when in fact they don't do much about it it's just as a facade that they're exposing their social consciousness consciousness and i find that as a group we're well positioned to attempt to have an impact in that space even if we're in a small in a smaller capacity I think that we can build upon that and have some sort of influence for change. Uh, in having a listen at the podcast, I, I did share it on the in the group. I don't know if anyone had a listen, uh, but I found that the and narrative- the hair as well in the chat and on the mirror board. I shared ah, it in good. the chat and on the mirror board, yeah. Thank you, because I wasn't able to put it on Mar Maru. I don't know why I wasn't able to paste it. Um, I think that the narrative is um, a little misleading because it's a situation where it's either we are for or against, let's say, petroleum companies. But we're all a little bit hypocrite about that because we're all consumers of petroleum derivatives. Either we have cars, our screen we're looking at today has some plastic on it. So what the hell are we talking about not wanting to embrace the change for other energy source. Uh, and we have to look at it as a, as, a, as a whole, where we're part of the problem, but we're also part of the solution. And I think it's something where we have, there's a balancing point because uh, it can be all very fluffy type of uh, messages. Uh, but at the same time, I think we have to push in that direction and stay positive. And that's, that's the way that we can get some inroads with regards to that. So if I, in a, if I bring it back to what was said on the podcast is either advertising agencies are for mess, creating messages for petroleum companies or they're not. And they take a strong position on that and there's different plat platforms. And I remember last year that you did share a platform. I think it was UK based where there's some sort of, uh, you can sign up to be a part of that. Uh, yeah, the ethical move. Yeah, let me. Right. Yeah. And there, was, there were a few that were shared there. I just find that petroleum companies have large resources. They have human resources that are, you know, they're youngsters that are in there that are getting more. They're getting, I, I would bet, uh, sensitive about the whole uh, impact that their, their industry is having. And so how, how can we change, like I said, change the narrative where yeah, we need petroleum companies to invest in renewed, uh, in green uh, energy sources. It's just to put more focus on that and, and basically to create demand. I think that in the essence, in the messages that they do uh, have in new, uh, new sources of energy, it's, we should, the narrative should be all about creating demand for that source. And the more there's demand for it, the more they're going to invest in it. And so I find that that's where there's a, a great leveraging opportunity. Uh, do, I, so, do, do I understand that part of what you're saying is that there's a lot of focus and energy going towards being against something, but I actually would like to focus on like, but what can we advance that is actually um, uh, sustainable or constructive? And, and while using petroleum companies, as a leverage for that change. Mm -hmm. And it's not to discard them. First, they have the funds, you know, they have a lot of capital to, to inject. It's just to redirect those funds in a mo more sustainable way. So it's a long battle. And I mean, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of obstacles, definitely. There's gonna be a lot of resistance for sure. But I think it's a battle that we don't have much of a choice to uh, embrace and it's just a, uh, posture, what type of posture we need to take. And I think I'm, for my part, I thought probably Derek and I, uh, talking on a personal level, I think that doing it, doing it more, try, attempting to do it in more of a Pacific way is more, is, uh, has more opportunity to have some impact than trying to create some division, you know, so. I think we that, probably have a lot of people in this community who are who probably feel um, the same way that you do about like how do we get the, the positive uh, forward work more. We also, of course, there are a number of activists, and I think people feel that 
um, you know, we need both. We need to put pressure on the old guard and we need to advance the, the new one. Um, I'm, I'm curious, um, is, is, is there anyone else who uh, sees what, or who else is seeing what George is seeing, which is like, there's, um, there's a whole lot of attention being put on pressuring all companies Well, there's not enough necessarily conversation about how we can increase demand for the sustainable side. I, I'm, I'm wondering, <clears throat> have you seen the latest uh, campaign by Shell here in the Netherlands, where they're uh, also uh, trying to position themselves in a sustainable way? Uh, have you seen that? I've not. Um, I've not, it's, but I, it, yeah. Yeah, while, while you were talking about this subject, I was, I was thinking about Shell really, because it almost seems, you know, obviously they want to reposition themselves to be more sustainable, more, uh, you know, en environmental friendly, but how can they really? Because really they, they've done so many things that it, it seems like almost impossible. I mean, obviously for, for Tony, Tony Sukaloni to kind of reframe, um, you know, their purpose, that, that was like somewhat doable, <laughs> I guess, but for, for like a company like, like Shell, it, it seems to be, an impossible task really. So how would you go about doing that? I mean- well, I, uh, Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. So um, Dr. Ayanna Johnson um, compares, for instance, like the petrol industry to the cigarette industry, right? Like it's really, really hard to ask of the cigarette industry to change itself into something healthy. Um, they don't have the brain power or they have a lot of money, but they don't necessarily have the talent or the capacity to, to turn that product into a different type of product. Um, and that marketing and brand has played a big role in, um, I guess, creating social license for cigarettes for decades. And um, that advertising agencies played a really big role in promoting uh, the use of, making the use of uh, cigarettes acceptable, socially acceptable. They were and making so, a lot of that. In a podcast, we're making a lot of parallels with the tobacco industry and yeah. how, and how um, uh, regulators and in the U.S. are are putting petroleum companies under the gun. They're really taking a lot of. There's a lot of pressure, legal actions that are taking place. So they're definitely feeling heat under the collar right now. Mm. I, I think to to your point, I'm sorry, um, Mart Martin. I think. Um, it's okay. the position I think is if, if petroleums were to consider their position as energy companies and not petroleum companies, we would already be in some sort of a regenerative mode with regard to the damage that they're, that they're creating. Another thought I had, an idea I, I thought is they're investing minute amounts of dollars, advertising dollars in greenwashing efforts or social licensing efforts. So the, the, the ratio is, is disconnected. If, we're, if for every dollar that they're investing, advertising dollars that are putting in social, uh, social uh, messages, they were, they were to invest 10 times or 20 times in green, uh, greener uh, uh, solutions, well, then it would start to make sense. But if they're, you're looking at their, their you're either looking at what they're creating, what they're have, making available publicly, and you know they're mostly public companies, so so some figures are available. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't make sense. They're investing for every dollar that they're investing, they're they're probably putting ten cents on green. Uh, so, but if 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 we say as an industry, we always fight for a ratio of let's say twenty percent so twenty percent of revenue against on advertising. Well, the same the same logic should hold for for those advertising dollars that are putting on social driven socially driven messages. So that's the type of thing I'm type of thing I'm thinking on how we create parameters so that it starts making sense, and so that and we we uh, embrace the efforts that are being made as long as those parameters are being met. And obviously, it has to be synchronized with all other elements that they're, they're doing, including the regulations that are taking, that are taking shape and how we get involved with the regu regulatory uh, instances. So uh, it's a little uh, all over the place, but I'm, I'm trying to be as uh, 
you know. <laughs> no, but I appreciate that you're sharing this thought actually as these thoughts are developing, right? Because I think these are such huge topics that we're all trying to get our heads around and it almost requires like a master degree in philosophy and ethics sometimes to understand what you like what direction or what you need to think about these things. And I like the the way I tend to look at changes. I used to be very much on the activist side and so I'm like, okay, well, not all of that is working. Um, because it's just again something, but it's not advancing the alternative. And then I switched to the entire other side, saying we only need to um, go for the first. But actually, I'm for those of you who are interested, another another book tip today. Um, if you're interested in this kind of dance of like, you know, is everything supposed to come out of social entrepreneurship, or are we, you know, is there also a role for for, for government to step in more, and are we undercutting government and um, uh, there is a, um, a book with a very subjective title, which is why I first didn't want to read it, but it's called um, Winners Take All, The Elite Charade of Changing the World, which is not exactly, doesn't have the sounds of a very unbiased um, writer, um, but it's really, really interesting. I'm, I'm all, only in chapter five, but it's very interesting, I think, for people in our profession of like, okay, well, um, there's stuff that's clearly wrong. There's stuff that we hope will, you know, be picked up. And uh, what are the pros and cons of each of, of these developments? And he really unpacks some interesting cons. I'm sure to share links with that as well. Um, the uh, Anya actually has, I think, something, George, that ties into your um, topic uh, quite a bit. Anya, are, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hey, Anya is in LA, um, and um, <laughs> I hope you are, at least you were the last time we spoke. I said it's very early. Thank you for, for getting up <laughs> and uh, sharing your time with us. So um, uh, Anya, you uh, uh, work in the field of brand and marketing. Anya is a certified brand change trainer, and um, you were thinking uh, a lot recently about whether you can actually bring um, purpose kind of into companies through the marketing and brand departments. And the reason why I think this is a, this is an interesting thought for me um, from, from the point of where, where George, um, George's, point, George's point of view as well, is that we need people inside Shell to want to change Shell. And um, where could those kind of entrepreneurs and change makers within companies, where could they start? And I was, um, I was, yeah, I'm going to give you the floor to, to share your perspective from where you're sitting um, of um, what you see happening in 2022. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting conversation and it kind of started, I, I was reading one of the McKinsey's uh, um, point of view. They write a lot about ECG, purpose marketing, consumer marketing. Um, and uh, the, the point was made that, you know, the purpose needs to, purpose needs to come from within the company. Uh, and I absolutely agree with that because if purpose comes within the company, then we have Patagonia, then we have Warby Park, and then we have REI, very focused brands that have not only communications, but they have proof points. They develop programs that really prove what they stand for. So, but I think on the other side, which is absolutely great, but I think on the other side, if purpose starts with marketing or advertising, I think it is also possible because then, um, yeah. but it has its own limitations because the shelf life is very limited, right? Because you have a campaign that might be communicating what you what the brand stands for, like. One of the examples that I was thinking, it's the Fearless uh, Girl campaign, where they build a statue of the little girl standing in front of the bull. Uh, but it was done in New York to really kind of uh, manifest. It was done for an investing company. And the whole purpose was to communicate the equality and rights and equal pay for women, and that they can stand up to something as strong as uh, investment in the industry. 
And that was done specifically by a marketing campaign, but uh, it was a marketing campaign that I done by an advertising agency. And they actually, that company, they ended up, as I was looking into them, they ended up paying, um, they had some lawsuits because they were not for equal pay within the company. Uh, but that kind of forced them to change their perspective and bring more diversity into the company. But that's the, if you go with the marketing, yes, we can come up with a purpose, but can you deliver or have a long lasting impact? And I think the more I was thinking about those two, two things, I think we in the world where we marketing to very um, smart consumer, they demand more from companies, they have resources to find more information. So I think I'm arriving to the conclusion that I don't think it's purpose branding from within the brand or purpose marketing. I think we need both of those together because I think the, the beautiful thing happens when you have a brand that stands for something and you have those great proof points that can deliver, but then you also need to have a campaign that is able to communicate that to the consumer in a very inspired, which I think is part of the sustainability problem. We, have, we haven't communicated that in a way that inspires consumers or really showcases the benefit um, benefit on that in the inspiring way. So I think uh, that's kind of where I was uh, in my last thinking and going through all of this, arriving to the conclusion that purpose and creativity, it's a perfect blend um, and beautiful things could, could be done when you merge the two. Did you see that uh, like one of the big, I think the big are the people who made the whole purpose-driven company such a huge corporate thing um, was um, uh, Paul Pullman, the, the CEO of, of uh, Unilever, the former CEO of Unilever who actually got kicked out because shareholders thought he was a little bit too much focused on um, sustainability and not on the bottom line, but he has um, a new book out where he's making the case of why it's so important. Um, do you think that, um, uh, have you seen examples, I guess, of um, companies where because um, cause marketing or purpose-driven marketing was so successful that they have actually incorporated that purpose more into the core of the offer or in the supply chain? Um, have, you, have you seen cases of that in the US? where it has successfully transferred over from marketing to uh, from marketing. the company? And, from and marketing. Uh, you, you mean as an evolution or as a starting point? Because to my mind, Patagonia comes right up top level type of company that already it was ingrained, it was in their DNA and they're very successful with their, their stance right off the bat, but that's not an evolution. It's something where they're always, always driven by social impact. Um, as an evolution, you know, you know, there's, I can make a link. I, I, we, I was working for a company that was under the Wolverine Worldwide umbrella of footwear brands. And we, they had acquired the Patagonia license to manufacture and market Patagonia footwear in their system, in their, in our existing uh, system. And just the influx of the Patagonia mentality in a corporate, very, uh, you know, uh, how do you say, short-term driven results, <laughs> uh, you know, driven by short-term results, I should say, sorry. It had an impact on the way that they're handling their, their uh, social impact. So they were all having a talk about how they change their ways of manufacturing other brands with the, you know, the impact of tanneries on their letter coloring system and stuff. So, it had impact or just the way that the way that the, the DNA of, of uh, Patagonia was transferring somewhat into the Wolverine worldwide uh, frame of mind, I can put it that way. Yeah, and one other company that I am very fascinated about is IKEA, because it definitely did not start as anything, a company with purpose. It's all about uh, making furniture affordable for everyone and then you dispose it. So there's no sustainability at the core purpose. But I was looking at some matrix and um, Patagonia comes first one in sustainability ratings. Unilever, I think is up high as well. 
but IKEA is making a huge progress. And recently from their marketing perspective, what I've seen, they have the same, uh, they just launched a program, a buyback program. I'm not sure if it's the same in other countries, but in US you can actually bring it. IKEA furniture, which is the same idea as Patagonia, like, hey, we're gonna buy it back. We're gonna take it from you, go shop. So they are also investing in the more sustainable um, resources, um, uh, resources to build furniture. The investing in supply chain, uh, even uh, somewhere in Europe, they have the whole IKEA built as a park. So actually, they encouraging you to come by bikes, and they have a park built on top of the IKEA big massive building. So I think IKEA is one of those examples that I'm kind of fascinated. With, which again, it starts within the company change for their bottom line and marketing combination. But this is something I would love to, you know, to look more into because it came on my radar. So once I do that, I'll share my findings. Yeah, for sure. I think, I, well, the, the interesting, this, so living in Kenya where we have no IKEA, um, mm -hmm. the idea of somewhat quality furniture quickly available at a good price is very appealing. <laughs> Sometimes, but of course, you know, you know, also the damage it does to local economies and to the environment, of course. This year at the ADCN, which is the Dutch uh, Creative Industries Awards, um, the category that I was judging for, which is uh, the social uh, social uh, impact category, IKEA sent in one of their campaigns and it had to do with Black Friday. And again, to the point I was making um, with Sandra earlier about this idea of like buy nothing. So they had also had this Black Friday buy nothing campaign, but they had said, bring everything back for a day. And they had sent this in with a very well-written description of how IKEA is you know, making consumers um, consume less. And it really upset me. It, it upset me that people in a marketing department can actually honestly put this out in the world that one day a year we're going to ask people to consume less, whereas the rest of the year we're optimizing every single aspect in our store and our online environment to get people to actually buy more. And we're going to make furniture that doesn't last long. But so that's the critic in me. But then the other person is like, but IKEA needs to succeed at this. So if you are following them, um, I think that would be great because they obviously hold such a key to um, changing things around in the in the in the consumer landscape. Um, do you uh, do you think? I know that you also have quite a bit of experience, Anya, in the automotive um, industry, where obviously like the move all of a sudden to electric cars has gone really, really fast. Um, do you see there that, you know, the demand for electric is, is going up and, and therefore the kind of, you know, the purpose-driven marketing in a way is also, I'm sure, having a huge boost because now all of a sudden you have products that actually walk the talk more or less. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to see that uh, companies are investing and the demand is picking up, but not as fast as uh, as we want. And actually, demand now because of the supply chain, de demand does probably surpass the supply because it's 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 just a very hard time. Um, but it's interesting. I think you know when I start looking at the purpose space, and I was like, oh my god companies, they have to talk about the good that they do, but that's not how consumers operate. And even in the automotive space, I was so excited when I started working on electric cars and I was like, oh my God, this is my chance for carbon neutrality, sustainability messages, but it doesn't matter because think about Tesla. That's not what Tesla did. Tesla just like excited people, created this, uh, you know, not fiasco, but they really capitalized on those more external things that people values that people have status innovation and all of that stuff so i think with uh with that i think we're going to see companies putting purpose in into place but i don't think we're going to see that marketing all of a sudden is going to change i think we're still going to be talking because another thing is for electric cars it has to benefit your overall brand if your brand was for full performance 
yes, you have to change your supply, you're changing your product, but are you really gonna change your communication? Probably not because you're trying to build on the foundation that you have established. But I think internally, we're gonna see some changes made in, in companies as well. Plus, I think some stories are gonna come through, but it might not be your broadcast story. We have some other different channels um, you know, to, to push all of those feel good stories. I can add to Anya's uh, you mentioned that in a podcast, there was quite a bit on GM and how GM positioned themselves with a greener message in the electric car, electric car effort. And also, uh, there, were, there was something about the Super Bowl ad that they created using uh, some spokesperson, I forget the name, but it was very, in, very powerful and impactful. But it was, it's a bit of a case of a chicken and the egg where they need the grid, the electric grid for it to take place before they invest themselves massively into creating that demand. You know, it's a little bit of that. Balance act, balancing act I was talking about earlier. It's a tough, it's a tough call, but uh, something that it has to. Uh, I think it has to be gained uh, with a certain evolution curve, and it can't try. We can't attempt to do the whole, the whole bit, in, in so rapidly. It takes quite a while for it to to take to to take place. But it was a very interesting piece on the podcast. I really encourage everyone to to have a listen. I did something like an hour long. It's not that long. Well, I think all of the How to Save a Planet episodes are uh, are really, really impressive. Yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah. Um, Zalen will know this from, from being a participant in the Academy, but for us, like the whole starting point of the brand process is to think about what is the hook that is going to draw people in? Like, what is the insight that you have into the problem that customers have that you can actually link to as a as a company that is pursuing change. So I'm a hundred percent convinced. Like it's the same case as you know you're not going to sell vegetarian hamburgers to meat eaters based on stories about animal cruelty. You're going to sell it on taste or health. And the same with with electric vehicles. Tesla sold it by making those vehicles is super sexy. Like you're just the man or the woman driving up with that car in front of a bar. Um, or at a, you know, a party. Um, and I, I, I just put a link to um, uh, an article, I, I think I already, or a piece I wrote six years ago, but for instance, there's, there's a couple of different ways that you can think about, like, how can we position these initiatives in a less straightforward way? So for instance, there's very few people in the organic food space who differentiate on price. There's not price fighters within that food space. Um, and there is actually one brand uh, that is doing that. Um, and um, they're saying that they're so cheap because they don't have a brand, which I think is total bullshit because they do have a brand and it's very brandless, which is the brand. Um, and then um, there's, for instance, in Sierra Leone, I think it's Sierra Leone, there's a woman who has a, a fair trade clothing brand and she sells it on sex appeal. So she has super hot women in, and herself in fair trade clothing. And um, it's just a total departure from the image that you're used to seeing um, fair trade clothing. And so I think this prompt Anya to think about it differently is, is super, super relevant. Um, we, have, we ran through our um, uh, six, um, or sorry, our, our five speakers for today. I'm really sad that um, Raquel didn't manage to make it back because she actually has six or seven different points that she wanted to bring to us about diversity in advertising in Brazil and other topics. What I'll ask her to do is to see if she can actually record her talk so that we can um, all enjoy it later. Is there anyone on this call who's like, well, I didn't get the chance to speak, but I've spotted this trend or development and I think we should all know about it. Feel free to speak up. Well, I, uh, I might have one. Yep. I'm not very, very knowledgeable uh, about it, though, but um, I've seen that uh, Facebook has obviously, uh, yeah, kind of, well, has become meta now. And obviously, 
uh, Meta is now some sort of a really big virtual space. And, and what I see is that brand strategy is trying to kind of also be there. So some companies like Nike, for instance, they're starting to develop some stuff to yeah, have a virtual presence within this Meta yeah, realm. <laughs> It's almost like a realm. It's uh, it's kind of creepy on one hand, uh, this uh, virtual space. But I, as as I said, I'm not very knowledgeable about it. But I see more and more uh, uh, brands do that. They kind of, I guess, want to, uh, yeah, jump on the innovation bandwagon and and do something with that. But yeah. Well, we are lucky because we have someone on this call who I think knows a lot about that, which is Abilash. Avalash has been diving into okay, yeah. NFTs. <laughs> and so is there anything about what Martin is saying? Because I think you shared a link to a product by Adidas that's going to be launched in the metaverse uh, just yesterday with me. Yeah, so um, brands want to uh, jump onto it. This is something, uh, uh, it's a digital collectible, collectible basically. So uh, how NFTs and non-fungible tokens can be used in uh, the marketing perspective or uh, passing on the benefit to the consumer is quite interesting. Like there are brands who are using it in terms of uh, creating uh, unique experiences for audiences. But uh, if you look at the example that you gave just now uh, about uh, Facebook getting into um, branding themselves as meta and creating an environment around it, uh, the whole thing is the network effect of it. Now, currently, if you see Facebook, uh, Instagram, and all these platforms have grown because of the network effect these companies created. And what happened is all the people who jumped onto it have invested their time, uh, uh, social currency, all that stuff. But the benefit is completely taken by companies who own these platforms, the tech companies or media companies. They make money on advertising. Uh, consumer share their data, but they don't get any benefit out of it. They are not earning anything out of it. Now, the whole scenario changes when you look at the metaverse, which is basically a sort of a Web3 or blockchain experience. Now, here, you are basically, the consumer is basically in control of all his own data. Whatever he shares, he gets a benefit out of it. Now, an NFT is a token or a digital asset which he can own and monetize it also. Uh, for brands, it, it's really important how they engage their audience. Now, it, it's become, it becomes really important for them to engage their audience, uh, get them to spend on spend on the experiences that these brands are creating. Uh, what uh, a classic example would be something that Clinic Clinic is a um, uh, fashion uh, uh, personal personal care brand. What they did is they created uh, uh, NFTs with uh, for audience to basically engage with the community. And against that, what they do is they will uh, 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 give them, uh, let's say, 10 years of a decade of free products. So somebody who basically engages with the community, creates, a, uh, uh, creates content for the brand, or does something which gets in more audience into the network, gets something monetary, something important, uh, which comes back to them in the form of a token, which has some value. It is not just that you create something for the brand and then it just vanishes off. You have something of value, which is there for years. Similarly, all similarly Adidas, uh, Nike are creating NFTs, which is like a long-term uh, digital asset that the consumer can hold and also benefit from the value going up or the trade that happens around it. This is a completely new area. The main thing here is it's the power is not with the company. Our power is not with uh, the creator like Facebook. The power it with, is with the audience who would get into the place and engage with the brand. So who creates the network effect benefits from it. The, the larger the network, you get more, uh, say, there are native tokens, which basically gives you value. You can exchange that across different other experiences. <clears throat> I see Zaylin has his digital hand up. Um, do you want to follow on what Ablash is saying? Okay. Yeah, I, I have a question of how that, how some of this new um, world 
uh, impacts brand decisions um, and, and the, 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 um, the comparison that what I would offer would be things like, you know, in the world of radio, everyone needs a slogan or a jingle in the world of the internet, everyone's name needs to have like sound good with .com after it. Um, you know, uh, the, these elements of platforms that then, uh, and, and communication um, protocols that then influence the way we choose to present ourselves as a brand. Um, I would be curious to hear any insights on how the advent of the metaverse as a platform would have an impact on how we choose to position ourselves as a brand. Like, do we need to have a good 3D logo? I mean, it's just like very simple things from like a like a, like a um, operational standpoint, but also more conceptual and strategic as well. That's um, that's bouncing around my brain. Thank you. Do you have any ideas, George? Yeah, uh, I believe um, entertaining entertainers are jumping on board with this uh, meta environment. So we can look at brands as properties, uh, a little bit like entertainers, and perhaps looks a little bit more like event marketing initiatives that are jumping on those environments as a space where they can start leveraging uh, their brand values and into the audiences that are adopting those, uh, those spaces. I don't know if I'm clear enough, but I think that's one way to tackle this as a brand, from a brand perspective. Martin? Yeah, I, I've also seen a different perspective. So uh, obviously uh, one, one perspective would be, uh, okay, there's this new uh, metaverse and NFTs and uh, well, it's there. So how about we use it? But I guess the different perspective is maybe to not use it. And I, I have a pretty interesting example. So um, <clears throat> for instance, uh, Fortnite, which is a, a pretty big game uh, and some other games uh, have also been, you know, the people behind those games have also kind of been diving into, okay, what if we, for instance, uh, sell digital skins, you know, for characters that you play with uh, as an NFT. And um, there was actually some talk about that. Uh, and also I think uh, Electronic Arts or EA Games wanted to do it. But then there was a huge backlash by the community because um, apparently gamers uh, hate the idea that um, you're, you're, you're able to buy something digitally that will make you outperform someone else. Uh, and EA has done that a lot. Now, NFTs, is also something you buy. So it kind of has a negative connotation. And so there, there was a like a huge group of gamers that yeah, was in this community, their direct audience, that actually kind of rebelled to the idea of, um, of games uh, starting to use NFTs and stuff like Metaverse. So I was wondering, like, uh, it does sound nice and it sounds like proper innovation, but I guess for some industries, it can be a pitfall as well, right? Yeah, I think Martin, what you're saying is uh, true. If uh, the benefit that you get by buying uh, the loot cases or NFT, whatever you call it, uh, gives you uh, uh, an unequal advantage in jumping the scales. But if you flip it around and say that because of certain efforts or certain things that you've done in a community kind of a game, wherein you're playing with multiple people and uh, you've basically gotten more people into the game and uh, in a combined way you've crossed certain stages and then as a group you earn something out of it now this particular thing could be a token could be nft could be some currencies which you can you own it because that's basically uh, as a there's something called smart contract which basically gives it to your wallet now using this wallet you can take it out you can monetize it you can buy some other things outside this particular game. So it is not owned by the gaming company, which is giving you this thing. It is basically owned by you and you take it out of this environment. It is interoperable in some other experience. You go into some other game and you can trade it there or some other platform like OpenSea and trade it there and make money out of it. Uh, one of something else, which is basically coming up in the gaming space is play to earn. 
uh, this uh, fundamentally it's a do good kind of a thing that uh, developers are doing uh, coming up with projects where you you uh, enter a particular gaming space you uh, spend more time into it and you earn tokens out of it which you can monetize and convert into fiat currency buy things like there is something called axi infinity which is a game which is widely played which is widely played in uh, indonesia i think or philippines where people who could not earn during the pandemic they played the game and got the token which they could convert into the fiat currency so it basically uh, the technology allows you to remove a lot of things which currently uh, stop you from uh, earning money or earning value for your effort in a particular community you know of any brands um ablash to zaylan's question that you think are already thinking about like what to do with their brand assets or like who are kind of getting ready um for that like that someone like zaylan who's thinking about oh do i need to anticipate on this might that he might learn from i think a lot of uh Uh, luxury brands uh, who are into fashion space or um, like i think chanel and these kind of brands they are exploring this in a big way because uh, they might come out with a very limited edition edition kind of uh, product line and then option it in the form of nft which basically is owned by the user buys it and and it goes on for number of years or uh, music artists or music labels are basically using this <coughs> space cool. let's uh, i'll keep an eye out zayla and i think that's a super it's a super interesting question um we're at the end of the 90 minutes but george do you have some final thoughts or a final a final thought well, a final thought well like let's say whatever well, comes i'll leave you the final thought but it, what pops to mind is if i had few relations relationships with blockchain for some reason where it's like there's some sort of intangible uh something that's hard to come to grips with and also the other thought i had is like the market bell shape where we're in the early adopter or innovator stage and it's hard to see where there's some traction from brands right now there's going to be some innovative innovator brands i think that it, it's our responsibility to have this on our radar you know and yeah that's where i'm at yeah i guess i guess a lot of people are going to be dipping their toes and experimenting with this um and seeing like not making too big of an investment thinking that this might blow, all blow over um i i remember a big deal being made about second life when was that <laughs> we all had to be on set and every brand was in second every you know um what was the uh, what was the radio the, the audio app that last year like all of a sudden everyone had the clubhouse everyone had to be there and then um you yeah. know thanks everyone for for joining today it was so fun and i have to say this is the only session we've ever had where we've ended up with all guys so applause for the men today uh pleasure. you have managed to for the first time in brand the change history you've managed to outperform the women in terms of staying to the end uh, i really really appreciate it we need more men we have actually a diversity problem uh we have too few men um who we need male voices so i hope you all um feel <laughs> welcome to contribute that's uh, the first thing. and last time i want to hear that <laughs> oh wow well, yeah, yeah. Um but thanks so much for for all of you for coming and contributing you all contribute in ways by giving uh by asking questions by sharing remarks um I'm going to um share the recording uh tomorrow and we're going to share the Miro link and I'll also make sure to make a couple of introductions and ties uh, Mark whenever Nando puts out a new report we'd be we'd be very happy to share it uh, on your behalf and uh, enjoy the session. I'm going to look more into some of the questions that you I had and congrats on the kids really. I have to say it. I don't know if everyone is in on it or in the facilitator program, but uh, I wanted to ah, say the it. The new the, the new the new trainer's kit is out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah congrats. Yeah, oh, thank also, you. I appreciate it. Also also congrats on uh, yeah, establishing new uh, visual identity. Looks oh. uh, looks nice. 
Thank you. That's nice coming from a designer. <laughs> we, it's funny. It's like the last thing we think about, you know, at the plumber's house, et cetera. So thank you guys. Yeah, it was a very special one for me. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.